Discovery Church. How many of you guys glad you came today? Amen. Amen. I'm stoked that you are here for part three of this series we're calling Better, that God's plan is greater than my plan. Hey, before I get into the message, let me see the split that's here today. How many here excited about football, can't wait for the playoff Super Bowl? Where are you at? Football, football, football. Okay. How many of you are just like cannot care, don't care at all about football, could care less, could care less? Where are you at? I actually think they outnumber the football fans this service. Wow, what's wrong with you? No, I'm kidding. Um, excited about that. Glad that you're here, though. You're going to catch the game. Some of you came to this service intentionally so you can catch the game later. But we're in this series called Better, and um, that God's plan is greater than my plan. And, and you may be here today, and that might not be something that you fully believe in yet. That that's not something that you kind of, you might not be there yet. There's, inside this room today, there's a lot of different people come from different spiritual backgrounds. You're on a different areas of faith and spiritual journey. That's all good. You might not be there yet, but here's my challenge. Even if you're not there yet, even if you don't fully believe, can I encourage you? Just give God a try. That, that's, that's what this series is about. It's like, look, you've been trying it your way for a long time. You've been doing your way, your plan, your agenda, your ambitions. You've been doing it that way, and you're getting the results of your plan. If you at all, there's anything inside of you that says, there's got to be more than this. There's, there's, there's got to be more. I think there's, there's, I was meant for something more. There's got to be more to life than this. Then give God a try. You have given your life over to the pursuits of so many other things. You pursue money or people or success or, or I don't know what you pursue, but you pursued a lot of things. Give 2020. Here's the challenge, and it's for anyone, no matter what stage of faith or belief that you're at. Just, I'm telling you, if you give God a try and you say, 2020, God is your year. It's your year, God. I'm just going to get on your plan. I'm going to pursue your plan. I'm going to get my life in line with your plan. If you do that, no matter what stage you're at, I, I just believe with all my heart, your life will be better. I'm not saying it'll be perfect. It's going to be all, all roses and nothing, but I'm just saying God's plan is better than your plan. And so that's what we're talking about in this series, that God's, he has a plan for your life, and it absolutely is better. And I want to talk to you about today in part three, I want to talk to you about that plan, that God has a better purpose for your life. Look at Hebrews chapter six. Here's our theme verse again. Hebrews six says, we are confident that you are meant for, say it out loud again, we are meant for better things. I want to talk to you about those things, those things that God has for you, those better things, things that actually come along with salvation. So you have this purpose. You have a, you have, God has a plan. God has some things that he's planned for you, and he wants to lead you. This year, in 2020, he wants to lead you. He wants to lead your heart. And that's how God leads us. When God leads us, he leads us through our, through our hearts. He speaks to us and gives us counsel and guidance. Psalm 16 says it like this. That he says, I will praise the Lord who count, counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. So, so God counsels me and gives me guidance and direction, and, and it's through this, this window of my, of my heart. Now, when the Bible talks about your heart, what it's speaking to is your interests, your desires, your passions. That's, when the Bible talks about your heart, he's speaking to, and God is speaking to, and the Word is speaking to, your hopes, your dreams, your your ambitions, that's, that's what, and, and God created you with that heart. And so he wants, God created you with those dreams and those passions and those ambitions and those desires. He, he put them there as part of your design because there are things that, there are things that excite you. There are things that you get excited about and there are things that could, that you could care less about. Like football, right here. Like some of you get excited about football, some of you could care less about football. I'm not saying God put the desire to love football inside of you, but what I'm saying is he created you in such a way that you love the game, that you love the sport, that you love certain things and you're attracted to certain things in your life and you're not attracted or even bored by certain things. That's God's work in your motivation. He wired you that way. Um, and, and, and in fact, the Bible says in Hebrew chapter or, or Philippians chapter 2, sorry, that it is God who produces in you 
the desires. That's the, the heart. He produces in you the passion, the desire, the ambition, and actions that please him. God put that desire there. You have a, you have a unique heartbeat. And I'm not even just talking about emotionally. Emotionally, you do have a unique, unique ambitions and goals and dreams and hopes. They are unique to, to you. But you also, did you know, have a unique physical heartbeat. Like there's, you have a, you have a thumb print, you have an eye print, you even got a footprint. Do you know you have a, a heart print, a heart beat that is unique, that there is never been and never will be another person that has the exact same heartbeat that you have. It is unique. Your, your, God created you with these unique dreams, unique motivations. He wired you that way. And listen, listen, he wants to lead you in 2020 in your life. He wants to lead you by counseling, instructing, and speaking to your, your heart. But here's where the problem comes in. Life happens and our heart gets beat up, bruised, battered, and broken. And, and every one of us, we are going to, whatever God speaks, his revelation, his rhema, because he's got it for you. He's going to speak and counsel and lead. But we filter God's word through the, through the condition of our hearts. So his word may be pure for your life. It's absolutely pure. And his instruction is good. And his counsel is good. And his wisdom is right. And his direction is just. But we receive it and filter it, process it through our hearts which sometimes is broken, which sometimes is beat up, has been battered or is bruised. So if God is going to do something different in 2020, if God is going to produce some better things that come with salvation in 2020, then we need to deal with the condition of our heart. We need to deal with some things. And there are five conditions that I want to talk to you about. I'm calling them heart stoppers today. They're the spiritual cholesterol that'll block your arteries. They are the, they're, they're just, they're what stop you. There are some things that'll stop you from living a life of passion, a life with hope, dreaming the God dreams and going after the God things. There are some things that clog your heart that when you hear even a message like this or, or when you hear from God in your own time, it just gets filtered through the pain and your past, and some things, and, and if we want God to lead us to a better purpose, we have to deal with the condition of our heart, the heart stoppers. And write, some, write some of these down. Here's, here's the first heart stopper we got to deal with, and it's disappointment. Disappointment is a heart stopper, because you've been hurt. Some of you, you've been hurt, and here's the tendency. Here's the tendency when we get, we get hurt. We pull back into our shell. We pull back into our protective zone in our safe area and we create the barrier and we say, you know what? I'm never going to let that happen again. I'm never going to let anyone hurt me again. So we give up on our dreams. We give up on our, on our purpose. We give up on our ambitions. We give up on our interests and our passions and you pull back into a protective mode and you say, well, the number one goal is never be hurt. That's the number one goal and that's a bad idea. That's not living. You're just existing in a shell and God created you for more. Proverbs 13 and 12 tells us why. It says, hope deferred. So I had an expectation. I hoped for something and it didn't happen. I had a disappointment. I thought something was going to happen. It didn't happen that way. I got disappointed and it made my heart sick. And some of us were, were walking around with sickness in our hearts because we haven't dealt with the disappointment of our, of our expectations. And, and if, if at first you don't succeed... Welcome to the human race, right? This is, that's nor, you're normal, okay? You hardly ever succeed the first time you try at something. It's part of the process. It's part of the, the journey. But if you allow disappointment to sit in your heart and rest there, it'll keep you from your purpose. It'll keep you from living out the better things that God has for you. Here's another heart stopper, fear. Fear is a heart stopper. It keeps you from being who God wants you to be. Proverbs 12, 25 says it like this, that anxiety in a man's heart, look at this, it says, weighs him down. And, and some of us, this is like a reality, like that, so that weight is real. And some of you know it, the weight of your anxiety, the weight of your fears, it's just pulling you down. It's a self-made prison. It's what, it's what disables us from, from moving into better things and believing and hoping and dreaming is this is this anxiety, the pressure of fear 
holding. Jesus told a, a parable called the parable of the talents about fear. You may have heard of the parable of the talents. We actually get the English word talent from this story. We actually get it from this story. A talent in the biblical times when Jesus is telling this story, though, was a measurement of weight, a measurement of weight of silver or gold. That, and so Jesus tells this story of this man, this rich man who had three servants, and he gives them different measures of talents. And to one he gave uh, a few talents, he gave, he, he, to one he gave five, to one he gave three, and to another he gave one. And he said, here, go and uh, make some interest with it. He said, Do some, make the most of what you've been given. And by the way, that's what God says to you and me. God says, here you go, make the most of what you've been given. Now, God says, I'm not going to judge you according to what I gave them. I'm not going to hold you accountable for what I gave them, the position I gave them, the status I gave them, the city they were in, the family that they were in. I'm not going to judge you according to I, but I gave you. I'm going to make the most of what I've given you. You have 2020. Here's a whole fresh year. You got, you got 365 days. You got 24 hours in a day. Make the most of what I have given you. That's what God says. Make the most of it. Now, these servants, they come back. The first servant goes, hey, I doubled it, master. And the master goes, good job. Way to go. The second guy comes back. I doubled it, master. And he goes, way to go. Good job. And the third guy comes and goes, here you go. I didn't do anything with it. And the master goes, why? What did you, what's the matter with you? And the guy, the guy, he said, he asked him why. Why did you do this? And the, the guy responds, the servant responds, I was afraid. That's why. That's why I didn't do it. I was afraid. Fear will cause you to bury your talent. Fear will cause you uh, to stop living your dreams. It keeps you from attempting that goal. It diminishes your passion. It limits your vision. It shrinks your heart. Fear is a heart stopper that we need to deal with if we want to live out a better purpose. Amen? Here's another fear or another heart stopper and that is guilt guilt this is a big one because you can't be guilty and go after your dream at the same time you want to know why because guilt it, it takes an enormous amount of energy away from us it's it, it's like you're carrying this huge sack of garbage around your back all day it just takes so much energy you have to pause all throughout your day you get tired from carrying the the regrets of your past the the shame of your mistakes and the guilt and and you cannot be confident and guilty at the same time you can't even be passionate you can't live with passion and guilty at the same time psalm 40 says this my sins have caught up with me so that I can no longer see. Man, I, I just, I affect my vision now. I can't see what God wants to do in my life. I have lost heart. That's what guilt does. It causes us to stop even, even I can't even hear from God because I got so much guilt crowding my heart. I've lost, I've lost my way. It's a heart stopper. Here's another one, a heart stopper. Bitterness. Bitterness is, it'll eat you alive, man. Bitterness is, is, worse than cancer and illnesses. It's, it's the worst heart disease you can have. Bitterness will make you resentful, um, where you're always thinking about retaliation. You're always thinking about getting revenge. You're thinking about that person who hurt you in the past, and because of that, you're living in the past, and you're not, you're not getting on with your life. You're not getting on with your, your, your future. You're stuck in the past. Um, can I just encourage you today? Let it go let it go. Hey, they don't deserve forgiveness, but neither do you. You didn't deserve forgiveness. We didn't deserve forgiveness. We received the same grace from God. And look, you, you, don't, you don't forgive people because they deserve it. Listen, you forgive them because you deserve it. And you need to get on with your life. Get on. Psalm 73 says it like this, that when my heart was bitter, I was angry. I mean, you're mad at people all the time. You got a short fuse because that bitterness, it's, it's there. It's just a heart stopper. You, you didn't deal with it. You're hanging on to unforgiveness and offenses and issues, and therefore your fuse is short. You're hurting people that didn't cause the, the, the pain or of, your, of the issue. You're just hurting the people around you now. Because why? Because you're bitter. And he says, I was senseless, meaning like I'm illogical now. I don't make good decisions now because of this bitter that's eating me up. It's such a destructive force in our life. The Bible says that when we're, when we're bitter and we harbor unforgiveness, God, it can close the door from God 
moving and speaking in our life. In fact, the Bible says that if, if we are bitter and holding unforgiveness and offenses, then our prayers could even be hindered in our life. So thank, thank God he's given us, he's empowered us to be able to forgive and extend grace to others because those people, listen, the people in your past, they cannot hurt you anymore. They can't hurt you. They can only hurt you if you let them hurt you. Are you hearing me, guys? They can only hurt you if you let, and how do you let them hurt you? You know how you let them hurt you? By rehearsing it in your mind. Every time you think about it, every time you rehearse it, every time you go over in your mind about what happened, what they did, what they said, you're allowing that person to hurt you again. You know what you need to do? Go back and delete that tape. Go back and erase that thing. That's what you need to do. Go back and erase it. It's a heart stopper, heart disease that'll keep you from living your purpose. Here's the last one I want to give you guys. It's rejection. Rejection. It may be the most painful one of all. Anyone in here who's experienced rejection from a friend or a parent or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, anything like that, no. Rejection hurts, doesn't it? Rejection hurts our hearts. Psalm 64 verse 3 says this. They cut me down with sharpened tongues. They aim their bitter words like arrows straight where? Straight at my heart, man. What they said affected me. It influenced me. Some of you, when you were growing up, you, people said some things to you, and you let it affect you. You never really dealt with it. So it has affected who you are today, like, like what people said. Some of you, when you were growing up, people said things to you. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a teacher, something like that. You had someone say something like, like you're worthless. You're never going to amount to anything. You're ugly. You're uncoordinated. You're never going to be a success. You're not fill in the blank. You're, you're whatever it is, okay? And, and what happened was you believed them. Some of you believed because maybe they were an adult and you were the child and adults are supposed to be right and they're always right. So therefore, um, you believed them. Can I tell you something? Listen to me. They lied to you. They lied to you. You are not who the critics in your life say you are. You are who God says you are. And God says you are called. God says he made you. God says he created you. God says you, he has a plan for your life. God says you have a purpose. But what do some of us do? And I put this as, I put this as the last one in your handout, rejection, because if we have any of these heart stoppers in our life, if we have disappointment and fear and bitterness, what will end up happening is you will reject other people in your life. You'll reject them. Let me put the shoe on the other foot. Sometimes it's easier to see. It's hard to almost diagnose your own heart, to be self-aware. Our heart is so deceptive. So can I put this on the other foot? Because some of you have received rejection from other people. You've been rejected, and you thought to yourself, like, why don't they accept me? Why don't they, why don't they like me? Why don't, what? And, and can I tell you something? It's not about you. Sometimes the rejection that you've received has nothing to do with you. It's about them. It's, it's sometimes the rejection that you've received is not even, it's not really rejection, it's projection. It's projection. So that person has disappointments and fears and bitterness that they haven't dealt with. They have some things in their heart that it's just coming off on you as, as rejection. Could, so let's, okay, so let's put the shoe back on our foot. Could it be that you are rejecting people all throughout your life because they're not measuring up to your standards and your expectations, not because of them, but because you have a heart issue you haven't dealt with? Oh, are you hearing me, y'all? I hope you're getting this revelation, man. I hope you're getting something because if you want God to lead you and lead your life, your heart needs to be healed. Write this down this way. If you want God to lead you, look, open your heart to God and let him heal it. Open your heart to God and let it heal it. No matter your heartache, no matter your hurt, no matter your habit that you can't get rid of, nobody can heal your heart like Jesus can. And if you want something to be different this year, if you want it to be better and you want to go after a better purpose and better things, you have to open your heart and let God heal and touch those areas of disappointment and fear and rejection and, and bitterness you have to in order for God to lead your heart. Here's a Revelation chapter 30, one of my favorite verses. Revelation 30 verse 20 says, Jesus says this, Behold, I stand at the door knocking, he says. 
And some of you have sensed it, man. That's why you're even here today. Some of you have sensed it this year. Something is different. You desire something different. And you hear like a knocking. There's a knocking happening. But can I tell you something? You're going to want to. There's going to be a part of you that still wants to hold on to the fear because you feel it keeps you safe. There's security in, in having that fear. Some of you, you're going to hear the knocking, but, but you want to hold on to that disappointment. You want to hold on to the hurt and the bitterness. You're still going to want to hold on to that resentment and that unforgiveness and that, that you're still going to want to hold on to that, but you still hear the knocking on your heart's door. Here's what the Bible says. Revelation 3 continues. He says, if your heart is open to hear my voice, and you open the door of your heart, I will come in to you, Jesus says. I will come in and heal the issues of your heart. Listen, if you want it to be better, you got to let them in. If you want it to be different, you got to let them in. Because God is speaking, and he's leading, and he's giving counsel. It's just getting filtered through that disappointment you haven't dealt with. It's just getting filtered through the fear that you won't give God. It's just getting filtered through the bitterness you won't let go of. It's getting filtered through the, through the, through the pain and the hurts of your past. Open your heart to God and let him heal it. Psalm 119 says this, if we were ever to do that. It says, I run in the path of your commands. I run in the path of my destiny. I run in the path of your purpose, God, for you have set my heart free. See, God, when you set my heart free, I'm able to run this race marked out for me. When you set my heart free, I'm able to run in the path of your purpose, in the path of your commands. If you are ever to let God into your life, into your heart, and let him heal your heart, I promise you, what will follow after healing your heart is purpose. If you let God heal your heart, he will reveal his purpose for your life. And so I did some study, and, and I've studied God's purpose and how he works. I've, I've studied this a lot, but I did something different this year, where, or this last couple of weeks, where I wanted to see how God reveals his purpose. And I found that there are four primary ways in the Bible, there's probably a lot of different ways that God does reveal his purpose, but there are four primary ways that God will and does reveal his purpose in our life. So if we're ever to let God heal our hearts, He'll reveal his purpose, and how he reveals his purpose is usually one of these four ways. And you can probably see how God is speaking to you, honestly, in every one of these ways. Write this down, because how does God want to reveal his purpose? Number one, God reveals his purpose in the scripture. One of the ways is the call from birth. The call from birth. Like early on in your life, some of you knew. I was, I'm supposed to do this. And some people say that, like, like I just knew. I was created at a young, I was supposed to do this, this thing. But then something happened to your heart. Life happened. Hurts happened. Relationship happened. Jobs happened. Way too many kids happened. And then we just, we, 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 something, something happened. And some of you feel like you've traveled too far You've gone too far for you to get back on the path of your purpose. And I, wanna, I want you to hear, please hear me today. You are not too far for God to get you back on the, on the path of your purpose today. Amen. You are not too far. You haven't, no matter how far you've gone, God can still get you onto his plan no matter where you are. And the best example of that, of this call of God, is in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah's life. In Jeremiah chapter 1, he says this. Before I formed you in the womb, like from birth, he says, I knew you, God says. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Can I just speak that over somebody today? God says, before you were ever created, I formed you. I knew you. I set you apart. And I appointed you. And that is true for every one of you. God has a plan for your life. And then Jeremiah responds. And he says, alas, sovereign Lord. I said, I don't know how, and that's where a lot of us stop, right there. I don't know how, though, God. We, we hear God, but then we filter it through the resume. We, we, we compare God's plan to our own resume, and we go, I don't know how to do that. And you're measuring yourself by yourself instead of the God who's called you. And he says, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said, do not say I am to whatever. I am to 
young. I am too uneducated. I am too, I'm not enough or whatever. God says, don't you dare compare yourself to those things or even by yourself. Do not say I'm too young. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I command you. And he says this, do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. God has a call from your life. And some of you, some of you here, you've known it. Like from a young, young age, you have known God's call. You just say, I knew it. Just, I got this. And, and, and just life has happened. And stuff has gotten your heart and gotten in the way. I remember when I was in fourth grade. And, and um, we were elementary school learning. We were reading our science book. And they were going over evolution and creation theory and the Bing Bang. Big Bing Bang. The Big Bang. Yeah, I don't know what that one is. The Bing Bang. <laughs> the Big Bang. And there was this, uh, we were going over all that, but then there was this one paragraph. I don't know what the, the, the books say now, but there was this one paragraph to intelligent design. And, and, and in that one paragraph, it talked about, it just said something like, some people believe that there is a God or, or a being that has created everything in all existence. And that stood out to me. And I don't know about you, but I was not raised in a Christian home, in a religious home. I had no knowledge of really of God or, or Bible. And I would go visit my cousins, uh, my aunt and uncles in Riverside, and they were Seventh-day Adventists and so a Christian. And they, I would hear a little bit, but I was so young. I just said, I have no knowledge of God or Jesus, but that stood out to me. And I raised my hand and said, what is that? Who is this being? Who's this supernatural being that has never been created and that like the teacher just came alive because someone asked her a question and she could talk about it now and so she went on and then other people in the class are talking about what they believe that they believe in God and they go to this church or they have this belief and I was like amazed at this but confused at the same time I felt a sense of like purpose and fulfillment but a sense of confusion as well I remember going home and talking to my mom my brothers were all around and I said mom we were at school today, and I explained the situation, but my teacher said there's this being who's created everything. And I remember asking her, what do we believe? I need to help me. I'm confused. What do we believe? And she said, Jason, don't let anybody tell you any different that of evolution and all that stuff. There is a God who created everything and created you, and there is a Jesus who has died for you. And she started explaining these to me, and I, she's never explained it to her before. We've never been to church or anything, and I remember just crying as she's explaining this to me. And I told her, I said, Mom, how come you never told me? How come? I know at that moment when she told me that, at that moment that the teacher even was talking about this, this side of creation, intelligent design, God deposited something in me, that he called me and appointed me. At that time, I had a hunger and a desire to know God. And it was a long time of just running away from things throughout my life. But I know at that time, at that moment, God appointed me. And there are some of you here that know there were some things that were deposited into you. And God spoke to your heart, but your heart got polluted by things. That's just a way. One of the ways God wants to reveal his purpose to our life. Here's another way. In scripture, how God does it. Number two, growing awareness. Growing awareness. So you're discovering your purpose incrementally. And, and the, the, so you get like an idea, a dream. The best example of this in the Bible is Joseph. Joseph gets one dream. He gets an idea, a dream from God. And then he's dumb enough to tell his brothers about it. <laughs> We're reading this in the one-year Bible. Right now, if you're reading along in the one-year Bible, or reading Genesis and all the way from like 32, Genesis chapter 32 to 50, is the story of Joseph. Joseph gets this idea and he tells his brothers, you're going to bow down to me one day. He even told his mom and dad, you're all going to bow down to me one day. And, and so he, he gets his dream, but then it's just, it's a process, like an incremental. He, he gets the dream and then he finds himself in a pit, sold into slavery, in prison. And it seems like from the idea or the dream that God spoke to me, the purpose, like I'm moving further away, God, but but all those, we find out in the end of the story that all those things actually had to happen and in order for God to do what God wanted to do. He, all the wrong turns had to happen so God could redeem them and do something amazing inside of it. And so, so he gets into Genesis 50. It's at the end of the story where um, he's standing in front of his, bro in bro in front of his brothers. 
He's took all these detours and wrong turns, and, but now he's the second most powerful guy in all of Egypt. He looks Egyptian, Egyptian. His brothers don't recognize him. He had the power right there to just, you know, get revenge. And he says this in Genesis chapter 50. Check this out. He says, you intended to harm me. So, so you thought that that pain, that issue, that, that, that hurt when people hurt you, you thought that when you were making those decisions and you were going further away, you thought that all that, look, it was intended to harm you, but God is going to turn around for good. But God intended all that stuff, like the wrong turns almost had to happen in order for God to redeem them and do something amazing in your life to accomplish what is now being done. He said, the saving of many lives. No, it couldn't happen. It couldn't have happened unless the wrong turns happened. What I'm saying is this, you guys, my point. Don't misinterpret what you're going through or what you've, what you've been through. God wants to use that for the saving of many lives. Amen? It's just one of the ways all throughout the Bible that God reveals his purpose is through a growing awareness. Here's the third way God will reveal his purpose, and that is a walking through open doors. Walking through open doors open doors. And in other words, God can only reveal his purpose as you take a step through an opportunity. See, and this is important to understand because some of you are waiting for God's understanding and revelation before the step, and that's not how it works. God will only, see God, and God has even, and I'm going to speak this right now, God has presented you with opportunities. They are divine opportunities for you to step into. And he won't tell you what's on the other side of it. You will never know what's on the other side of that opportunity until you take a step of faith and step into that. And some of you, and let me kind of explain this. Some of you are waiting on this side of the opportunity of the open door and, and you're not living out like God's purpose for your life now. And you're thinking God's purpose for my life is then in the future and not now. Let me explain something. God has a universal and a unique purpose. This, this is so important to understand. Every one of us has a universal purpose as, as children of God because God has chosen us, adopted us, saved us because we are his and he is ours. There is a universal purpose we all share, but there's also a unique purpose. And much of what I've talked about here today is the unique things, the unique counsel, the unique direction that God wants to speak into your life and lead your heart. But you do also need to know, I need to pause and, because, and tell you that you also have a universal purpose. The reason why this is important is because God will not reveal or have you walk through the open doors of opportunity. He won't even open the door of opportunity unless you are first accomplishing the universal purposes of God. He will not give you a unique purpose of God. So what is the, what is the universe? Every, we say it like this. Every, every child, every, every, every one of us are created universally with this purpose, to love God passionately, to love each other authentically, and to make a difference, to change the world for the cause of Christ. See, some of us are waiting on this side, and you love God, and you want your purpose, and you want better things, but you'll never see the open door of God because you're not living with passion now. You're not living with purpose now. You're not loving him with everything you have right now. You're thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it on then. Uh, you're, not, you're not living an authentic community now. You're thinking, I don't need it now. You need it then. You're not making a difference with your life now. You're saying, I don't need to make it. No, making a difference with my life and changing the rules, you know, in my purpose. It's not now. And you will never get the open door unless you start now. Amen, somebody? Amen. So whatever, whatever you're doing, do it with all your heart. I love what... Lo what Martin Luther King Jr. says. He has a quote. It's beautiful. He says, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should, be, he should st uh, sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote, wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Oh, ain't that good? See, I just, I just feel like you need to know that living on this side of your, your purpose your, or this side of the, op the open door, you need to start living with passion now. Deal with the things in our heart and live with passion and purpose now, and God will open a door. And the best example of walking through the open doors of opportunity that I could find, there's a lot of them in the Bible, but the best example is Queen Esther. Esther, in your Bible, there's a whole book, Esther, but Esther is... Um, 
She's a, a Jewish girl. Her parents died. She got adopted. She's living in Babylonian culture. So she's a misfit, but she's beautiful. And the queen, the, the king one day has this beauty pageant, and she wins the pageant, becomes a, the queen of Babylon. Of Babylon with, and, and, and there's this guy in the king's court, one of the officials, that wants to kill and eradicate all the Jewish, Jewish race. And here she is, a Jew, but they don't know she's a Jew. And her uncle Mordecai tells her, hey, you didn't become queen just so that you can live in a palace and live comfortably and be a queen. You got this position so that you can have the king's ear. And so it says in Esther chapter 4, the, uh, Mordecai is telling Esther, for if you remain silent, if you don't step through this opportunity, and I'm going to speak that, come on, some of you got some opportunities that you've been waiting on. You've been, you need to step through the open doors of opportunity God has. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. God is saying, if you don't step through the opportunity, if you don't take advantage of that, I'll, let, I'll have someone else do it. Look, you don't, look, God don't need you. You need him. We don't have to serve God. We get to serve God. God is saying, look, I got some opportunities for you, but they're, they're, and they are for you. You ain't doing me a favor. I'm opening a door. Do you want to walk through it? No? All right. I'll give it to someone else. But you and your father's family will perish. Don't think that you are going to preserve yourself by staying on that side of the open door. Ah. By staying on that side of the opportunity. And then he continues. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And that's how God will reveal his purpose. He'll give, he'll, he'll give a such a time as this window, present you with an opportunity. And she says, I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Um, so I'm just telling you, there is, there is a such a time as this moment in your life that God wants to reveal himself. There are opportunities that are presented to you. There's opportunities of you to serve on the dream team. Actually, our next steps classes, we do it every month here at Discovery to help you discover your purpose and start living the life God has called you to live, to love God, love each other, and change the world. That's our whole, that's why we do Next Steps every month. And there are opportunities for you to get connected to a group. There's opportunities for you to lead in a group. And some of you are sent on this side going, I don't know if I can. And God is going, Come on, this door ain't going to stay open for long. You need to understand that we serve a God that opens doors no man can shut and shuts doors no man can open. And he'll reveal himself by opening the door of opportunity. Here's the last way God will reveal himself. He wants to reveal his purpose, and that is through a God encounter. A God encounter where God just speaks, man. In the moment saturated in his presence, you hear the whisper in your heart because your heart is open. It's been healed. It's not cluttered, but God speaks in a God encounter. And for anyone here that hasn't had that, that moment, you can. You can have that, that moment. It is available. It is available to you. The best example is in Acts chapter 9 with the apostle Paul. And before he had this encounter, his name was Saul. And it says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul, before he became Paul and was, a, you know, appointed as a, an apostle, he was persecuting the church, like killing the church. He's, he was the one standing by as they stoned Stephen. It continues. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters, like permission, to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, and that's what they called Christians back then, the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He said, let me sick them. I'm going to go get every one of them. Then it says, and as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, and I just pray uh, for a suddenly moment in your life. Like, like I, can, I can preach God's word. I can share with you God's word. We can create even atmospheres of worship and prayer and lights and all that stuff. But one thing I cannot give you is suddenly. I can't give you a suddenly moment. And I pray that God gives you a suddenly moment. And if you haven't had, if you haven't had like a suddenly moment, I want you to, we're, we're having our night of worship this Wednesday. This Wednesday is a night of worship saturated with the presence of God so that God can speak. And some of you say, well, I haven't had a suddenly moment. Maybe it's because you haven't been in the room when God was there. I'm acting. I'm actually, and which is God is omnipresent, don't get me wrong, but there are moments where God's, his manifest presence is saturated. I'm actually speaking a, a series this year I got planned called In the Room. The, 
in the room and, and, and the power of just being in the right place at the right time. And the reason why those opportunities haven't opened to you, the reason why you it's unclear or you haven't heard, you're in the wrong room. Come on, somebody. I'm going to preach that later. Um, he says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice and said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? He says, Saul asked him, and I, Jesus, he says, I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. And he replied, now get up and go. And God has, as you walk this journey out with God, as you walk this thing out, man, God's going to have some get up and go moments for you. He's going to say, and I, and I don't have enough time to go over all the get up and go moments of God. That he's told me, get up and go, give that word, get up and go, speak that, get up and go, plant that church, get up and go. And, and, and as you walk this out and your heart is open before God and healed before God, God wants to lead you. And he's going to tell you, get up and go. Here's the, here's the truth. Write this down. God created me on purpose for a purpose. I hope you receive that today. And you're going to hear this over and over and over at Discovery in different ways. God created you on purpose for a purpose. Will you receive it? God created you on purpose for a purpose. I have been saved to serve. That's why God saved you. Last scripture, and then I'm going to pray. Galatians chapter 5 says this. Stay with me, you guys. Galatians chapter 5. Thank you so much. You were called to freedom. Brothers and sisters, only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses. God has created you. He has set you free. What he's saying is, don't, don't, just, don't just be selfish with it. No. Serve each other through love. God created you on purpose, for a purpose. You have been saved to serve. Come on, let me pray for you all over this room.